Okay, um, so, well, good morning again. Um, so in this second lecture, um, what I'll try to do is I'll try to go um, and, and look into different topics where the connection between AI and imprecise probability has been strong, has been studied, has been, you know, uh, investigated uh, in depth. Um, of course, I will not try to go into very much detail on any one of these four topics. Uh, otherwise, you'll be confused rather than enlightened. Um, so what I'll try to do is I'll, I'll go into each one of them. I'll try to present the main ideas. These are uh, topics that have many uh, different uh, technical aspects. So I'll try to simplify as much as possible. And, and, and convey a sense, uh, in a sense, why is it that imprecise probability has been used? Where it has been used uh, in these topics, okay? Uh, the first one is probabilistic logic. And this is sort of an old topic in AI. Uh, the reason why I'm, I'm in, uh, 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 describing it and discussing it now is that it's sort of a basic topic. It, ex it sort of explains why is it that AI has so many people throughout the years looking at imprecise probabilities, because it's sort of natural that you have all this interest in AI in, in representing things, um, often using formal languages, often based on logic, and you have all this interest in AI to handle uncertainty. So it's kind of natural that people would put these things together and, and look for languages that combine probability and logic. And in doing so, they will naturally, as I will show, as we try to show, get into imprecise probabilities. Um, and that's, that's sort of why is it that, uh, why people are, are, uh, have been looking at probabilistic logic for so long. Also, I think probabilistic logic is interesting because there are many other formalisms in AI. Uh, and for example, I'll show later probabilistic argumentation formalisms that rely on ideas from probabilistic logic. If you don't know that, okay, you can survive. But if you know that those ideas come from probabilistic logic, you get a lot more understanding of what's going on. Okay, so. So probabilistic logic is sort of a, one of foundational things uh, in AI, if you will, um, because uh, you can understand so many other things from it. Now, probabilistic logic, the, the, the term probabilistic logic could be interpreted in many ways, right? You could think, well, this is like a Carnap's system of uh, assigning probabilities to, prob probabilities to a logical formula. Well, in AI, probabilistic logic means one thing. It means assigning probabilities to logical sentences or formally. And I will explain what this means by looking back into the work of Nielsen. Uh, so Niels Nielsen in 86, back then, he was uh, already a, a key figure in AI. He was responsible for one important algorithm uh, in AI, the A star algorithm. And also, he was uh, one of the leaders of the project on the Shaky robot, the one that you see in the photo, uh, uh, an old mobile robot, uh, a small cart that could walk, uh, move around. And in 86, he took upon himself to see what could be done with uncertainty. And back then, logic was the main language in which you could express things in AI. And so he proposed a, a language, he proposed a formalism, where you had sentences such as these. Um, you assign the probability to A. You, you, say that the prob you state that the probability of A is larger than or equal, uh, or equal to A, alpha, some number alpha. And if you have a collection of these uh, assertions, these uh, assessments, then maybe you can uh, ask for some other probability. You may ask for the probability of some other uh, sentence, okay? 
Now I'm using A here as a single symbol, but for Nielsen, A could be a logical sentence. I'll, later I'll explain this, this in more detail. And what Nielsen said back then in 86, he said, okay, look, if you have a bunch of these sentences and you want to know the probability of some other sentence, um, all you can say about the probability of this other sentence is that it, it lies within an interval. You cannot precisely know the probability of some other sentence. And he actually was able to present a solution for the computation of these bounds based on linear programming. Okay. And uh, it turns out that this sort of solution had been already uh, found, had been found by Halperin in 65, but Halperin was looking at pro propositional logic and by Angelo Giglio. Uh, a researcher that uh, is always uh, in the Isipta is is meetings. And, and Gini was looking at the language of events as developed by uh, Definetti, but basically the, te the techniques are basically the same. Okay, so let me uh, spend some time on, on this. Um, so Halperin in 65 was looking at the work of Bull the old work of Bull, where Bull was looking at uh, propositional form. You know, so he had propositions and these Boolean connectives, negation, disjunction, conjunction, implication. And, and Bull, back then, in 1854, uh, uh, Bull already considered the possibility that you could have a propositional formula and you assign a probability to, to the formula. Okay, so for example, you could have uh, A, uh, a disjunction, A or B, and you could assign a probability to this. You could say that it's, it's a half. Now, let me ask this. Uh, are you, can you see the, the board here? Yeah? <laughs> Sorry, I uh, can't hear you. We're, we're making it bigger right now, so. How do we make it bigger? Like so? Yeah, just start here. So, uh, should be fine, Fabio. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, so Bull was already considering this, this sort of sentence, okay, this sort of uh, pro assignment uh, of probabilities. Um, and then what happens is that if you have two propositions, A and B, you should, you should, you could consider all possible interpretations, all possible truth assignments. So you have A, you have B. So you have uh, both can be false. One can be true. The other can be true, and the other false, or both true. These are the possible truth assignments that you may have. Okay. So you have four uh, truth assignments if you have two pro two propositions, right? Uh, what well, the meaning of this uh, sentence here, the probability of A or B being equal to 0.5 in Bull's interpretation was that you should take uh, the, the uh, truth assignments where this, this junction is true, there are three of them, and you should assign half, the probability half to the, the set of the set of uh, true assignments, okay? So basically, you take the set of all truth assignments. If you have two propositions, there are two to the two. So there are four truth, truth, truth assignments. And then you take this set of uh, truth assignments and you interpret the probability of a formula uh, being larger or, or equal to alpha as the fact that the sum of the probability of all these truth assignments is larger than alpha. In this case, let's take larger than half. So if I, if I say that the probability of this disjunction is larger than or equal to half, basically I'm saying that the, uh, the probability of the sum of these three assignments is half, is larger than or equal to half. So let me say this. 
labeling these truth assignments. And what this means is that the probability of omega one plus omega two, omega two, omega three, and omega four larger than or equal to two. Because these are the three assignments where this formula, this propositional formula is true. Okay, so that, that was Bull's uh, interpretation for these formulas. And what Halperin did in 65 was to say, oh, look, this is a linear program because you have all these, um, you have all these um, true assignments, you have linear constraints on their probabilities, and these probabilities must satisfy the fact that they are larger than or equal to zero, and they add, to, they add up to one. So this is basically a linear program, what you have to, to handle here. If you want to know whether an assignment is, can be satisfied by some probability distribution, what you have to do is to, to decide whether this linear program has a solution. Okay? Um, I hope this is clear enough. If there are questions, please uh, uh, let me know. And I'm concerned that you can see the, the board because I'm planning to use it. Okay, so if, if you're not using, if you're not, uh, if you cannot see the board, please let me know. Now, this it turns out that this pro this problem, the, the solution of a linear program, in this particular case, it's it's what's called in computer science an NP-complete problem. Um, this has been proven uh, in 1991, I think. So it's, it's a difficult problem, but it's not so difficult. It's something that people solve. Um, and let, let's go through an example, okay? So let's see if this, this works at, as a, 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 in, a, in a class style, okay? So suppose I give you three um, assessments. I say that the probability of proposition A is larger than or equal to alpha. I say that B implies C. And the probability of B is, is, is beta, okay? Now, can you give me bounds for the probability of A and B and C, this conjunction? How would you do it, okay? So here's what Hyoprene will say. So let me write down the, what we have. So we have three, three propositions, A, B, and C. Right, we say that uh, the probability of A is larger than or equal to alpha. The probability of uh, B is equal to beta, and then we also say that B implies C. Okay, now how do we get bounds on the probability of A and B and C? That's the that's the question. So the idea uh, following the the bullish method is to write down the truth assignments. So here they are. There are three propositions, then there are eight truth assignments from the first one here to the last one there. And I'm hoping that you see that I'm painting this in blue. If not, please let me know so that I understand what you see. And what we'll do is we'll find the ones that satisfy A. Okay, because that's 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 related to the first uh, uh, probability assessment. So W uh, omega five, omega six, omega seven, omega eight, they all satisfy. They all assign true to to A. So what happens then is that the probability of A being larger than or equal to alpha will, will be um, represented as the probability of omega five plus omega six plus omega seven plus omega eight being larger than or equal to alpha. Okay. Now it turns out that uh, omega sub seven is impossible. You cannot have this particular truth assignment because this one violates the fact that B implies C. So you cannot have uh, the probability of omega seven is zero because omega seven is impossible. 
So this guy here, zero. Okay. Now then we go and is, we look at the property of B. Now B is true in omega three, omega four, omega seven, and omega eight. So actually, what we have then is that the probability of omega three plus omega four omega seven plus omega eight is equal to beta. Now it turns out that uh, omega three and omega seven are impossible. Well, because they violate the fact that uh, B must imply C. So these two guys here are false. They are impossible. Probability zero. And so you're left with these two expressions down here, where P sub I means the probability of omega sub I. And then you have that all of these probabilities have to be larger than or equal to zero, and the probability of the sum of these probabilities is one. And this is this is a linear program. It's a bunch of uh, uh, linear inequalities, okay? And if you want to know the probability of A and B and C, what you have to do is you have to maximize and minimize the probability of this guy, and the probability of this guy is exactly the probability of omega eight. So you have to maximize or minimize the probability of omega eight subject to these constraints. This is the solution. Okay, this is what Halperin offered as a solution for Bull's problem. And the problem for Bull is that he formulated this. But he didn't know how to solve. He didn't know linear programming. So he just, uh, if you look at Booth's book, 1854, he had already the, the problems he stated, but he couldn't really solve them as we do today with linear program, programming. And, and Booth had, present, for example, this challenge problem uh, back then. So um, these, there are three propositions. Uh, a bunch of assessments. And now look, these assessments are imprecise. So if you go back to Bull's book, uh, it, it has imprecise probabilities all over the place because all, all he's thinking about probabilities was already in terms of bounds. And then there is one particular uh, truth assignment that gets probability zero. And so what you can do is you can go to the same process that we did here. And I hope this was understandable. I hope we follow this um, and we will turn these assessments into linear um, constraints. They are here, down here, as I'm painting them in blue. And you can then, you may, for example, you may wish to know bounds on the probability of A3. Well, A3 is true in omega one, omega, Three, omega five, and omega seven. So the probability of A three is, is just the sum of the probability of these three assi uh, truth assignments. So what you have to do is you maximize or you minimize to get the bounds, um, the probability of this, the, the sum of these, uh, the, the sum of the probability of these three is four uh, truth assignments. Well, I hope that's clear enough. Um, so that's what you do. Now, there is a very similar kind of problem that appears if you, instead of using propositions and propositional logic, if you use events and relationships between events. And this, um, this is what happens if you, if you are interested in Definetti's um, theory of probability, because there you have assessments that give you bounds or, or, or probabilities over if, for events. And then you're interested in bounds for the probability of some other event, some event uh, H sub zero. Now it's, it's, it's a fact that the probability of, of H sub, uh, sub zero 
uh, belongs to an interval. And you get this interval by solving a linear program. And this is what Giglio did in, in 1980, um, bringing linear programming into the Finetti's theory. There you see the Finetti in the, in, the, in the picture. So let, let me go through an example. I hope this will be clear enough. And this is an example I, I took from uh, Coletti and Skozafava's um, 1999 paper on coherent uh, uh, decision-making. So suppose you have three events. Now you don't have three propositions, you have three events, but basically they're, they're the same, same language with different words. Um, and suppose you have this constraint, the constraint that H3 belongs to the intersection of the complement of H1 and H2, okay? And then you have assessments. You have assessments such as these. The, the marginal probabilities for the individual events. Now, first, let, let me uh, erase this. And what happens here is that you have three events, right? So you have H1. Well, let me use red. Have H1. You have H2, and you have H3. And H3 belongs to the intersection between H2 and the complement of H1. Okay, so it, H3 belongs to this region. And you know that the probability of H1 is, is half, the probability of H2 is one-fifth, and here is one end. That's what you have. Now, how would you know that the probability of some other um, event made of a uh, combination of these events, or how would you know that these probabilities are actually coherent, that they actually um, make sense? You can actually find the distribution that satisfies them. Well, you build a linear program. Okay, so let, let's, let's build it. So what you do is you have to, uh, identify various regions with, uh, in the, with atomic events. So A1 will be uh, H1 and H2 and the complement of H3. So this is A1. Then A2 is H1 complement of H2. And so this is A2. And then uh, A3 is, is here, A3. A4 is uh, inside H3. So this is A4. So actually A4 is H3. And A5 is, is the outside area. So this is A5, okay? And now you can turn these assessments into linear constraints over the, prob the probabilities of these atomic events. And for example, let's, let's take one example. Uh, let's say I'm looking at the first assessment, which is the probability of H1 is half. Well, H1 is, com is consists of A2 and A1 and A2. So the probability of H1 will be the probability of A2. One plus probability of A2. And this has to be half. Okay? And this is what you have here in the first, uh, first line. And so on. Okay, so you turn all these, um, these probabilities into um, the, all these assessments into linear uh, constraints. Now, if you want to have uh, conditional probabilities, so you want, for example, the property of some event A given B. Well, what, what is it that uh, Halperin did in 65? It's a long time ago. And many others have followed this. So if you have the property of A given B, larger, larger than or equal to alpha, what you do is you write the 
you write down the expression for the conditional and you you move this to the other side so actually you still have a linear constraint which is what uh, what I, I wrote here which is now I have in blue so nothing really changes if you have well nothing changes in computational terms or conceptual terms if you have constraints over conditional probabilities okay um, and here's an example. This is the same example as before. Uh, but now I have also a constraint on the property of H2 given H1 union H2. Okay, so you, you can build this linear program as an exercise. Um, you, you basically, you, you have the same program as before, but now you have another linear constraint that is, is generated by this particular assessment. So, there's nothing new if you have conditional probability under this uh, translation of, of uh, conditional probability. So I'll say something about this later. Okay. Um, now, how do you compute these things? There are many, many techniques. I'll go briefly through this. Um, in, in computationally, what you do is you do linear pro you, you do linear programming using column generation. So basically, you have this large linear program if you have too many propositions and then you have to generate columns and you do it through many different uh, ways um, so there this has been studied in depth there are there is also algorithms to handle conditional probabilities there is something called the charles cooper transformation there's the dinkelba jaganata algorithm this is actually exactly the same as Wally's generalized base rule for people who know it is exactly the same. Um, and then it's possible to handle imprecise likelihoods and, and so on. So I, I left here in this, um, this set of slides, I, I added maybe 15 slides on it on these uh, computational techniques, which I will skip because it's not the time to go over this. It's take long, too long. But if you have an interest, you'll find here uh, the formulation of these various techniques and examples. Um, so let me skip the algorithms because basically, if you understood how you translate the, the the language of probabilistic logic into linear programs, you have everything that is needed conceptually. Okay. Now, what may happen is that you may you may be interested in in adding more constraints. For example, constraints of independence between events. Um, so if you introduce independence, you have a lot more, a lot stronger constraints that are much stronger, right? So if you have A and B independent, the fact that you have the marginal probabilities for them really constrains completely the probability of their, their uh, conjunction. So if, if both of them are, have marginal probabilities a half, then the, their conjunction has probability exactly equal to one fourth, right? Now, the problem is that independence leads to nonlinear constraints, of course. I mean, you have to multiply probabilities to, to specify uh, independence in this way, the usual way, right? Uh, and there, there are many computational problems on how, how to handle uh, the resulting uh, optimization problems. Of course, what you can do instead of just having such a general language where you can have all sorts of assessments over all sorts of uh, formulae and then all sorts of independence constraints, what you can do is to organize these assessments using graphs. And this is along the lines of what Cassio presented uh, for Bayesian networks, right? In Bayesian networks, you organize the probabilities and the independence uh, relations using graphs. So you can do the same in, in this setting. And then you get what you, we call a credo network, which is something Cassio will, will explain later. Okay, so this is for, for other talks. Uh, so this is not um, something I'll do now. Now, let me just finish on this uh, brief uh, uh, discussion of probabilistic logic by saying that Nielsen, in 86, did not look only at propositional uh, sentences. 
he was looking at first order logic because that was the, the language of the time for artificial intelligence. So he, he was considering uh, sentences such as this. So man, uh, Socrates is a man or Socrates is a mortal or for all X, if it's a man, then it's a mortal uh, first order sentences. And what Nielsen did, he considered assessments where the probability is over a first order sentence. So you, you could say something like the probability of for all X, man X implies mortal X, you could give a pro you could assign probability to this sentence, okay? And, and Nielsen's uh, reduction to linear program is not as clean as the reduction that you get when you have propositional logic. Of course, because first order logic, when you have many sentences, you may not decide, you may be unable to decide whether these sentences are, are satisfiable. So, you know, it's a lot more complicated um, to, to handle the resulting sentences. There has been a lot of study uh, in, in artificial intelligence how to handle such, such uh, assess, uh, probability assessments over first order logic. I think the, the best work so far is by Jomar. Uh, they have a very nice paper in 2007 where they cover many decidable fragments of first order logic. I have here an example on this, but let's let's just say that uh, since Nielsen's work, there has been a lot more work on, on combining uh, probability and, and logic in, in this level of generality and, and much, much more, right? So there are there are formalisms that allow you to say things like uh, the probability that Tweety flies is larger than 0.9. This is already Nielsen's. Uh, Formalism, the probability that for all x, if x is a bird and it flies, being larger than 0.9, this is already in Nielsen's formalism. But you could you can say more things than this. You can say more complicated things. You can say, for example, for all x, the probability that if x is a bird and it flies is larger than 0.9. So this is this is different. So this is not within Nielsen's logic. So this is something did, uh, done by Joseph Hopper and collaborators back in, in the 90s. And, and you can say things about conditional probabilities. And there's more, like there's, there are logics where you can say, for example, if this is what I said here in, in the, the sentence that is in blue, you can say things, well, if you take the population of birds within this population, more than 0.9, more than 9% of the birds fly. So this is a little different from the other ones. So there's all these uh, languages that allow you to, to combine logic and probability. This goes back and I will just say one last thing and I'll move, which is there's been a lot of work within imprecise probability to handle cases where the conditional, the conditioning event may have probability zero. Okay, so I added a number of slides at the end here, discussing this, this, this case, this complicated case, uh, computationally and conceptually. If you're interested, you can see the slides later, but I'll, I'll, I'll stop my discussion of probabilistic logic. All I wanted to, to say is that um, there's been a lot of work on combining logical statements, sentences with probabilities. And what you get naturally, it's the most natural thing you get is a credo set out of this because you have all these constraints that you get by imposing probabilities over uh, logical sentences and these constraints constrain the probabilities to, to, to be within a set of uh, probability measures, okay? So that's one thing, okay? So this is one uh, stop that I would like to, to make and to the combinations of uh, probability and, and uh, artificial intelligence and uh, imprecise probability. Let me go to another uh, topic where artificial intelligence and imprecise probabilities have, uh, have met. And this, let me share the screen. All right, so this is, I hope you're seeing this, okay? This is a, 
Uh, second session is on probabilistic logic programming. Okay, uh, can you see it? Yes. 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 Um, so, since the this 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 uh, work on on probabilistic logic uh, happened back then in the nineties, there was a really uh, 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 an exploration and a, a, a search for simpler languages. Because what happens with probabilistic logic is very general, it's very flexible, you can do everything you want, but it's very complicated to handle computation. So there has been a lot of work uh, looking for better languages, languages that are flexible enough, but simple enough, okay? <clears throat> Some of these languages try to expand the language of Bayesian networks. Um, so, in some ways, you start with Bayesian networks and you add logical constructs to, to represent repetitive patterns. Other languages start with logic programs, and I'll say what these are. So that's the point of this part. So they start with logic programs and they add probability to the to logic programs. And in both cases, either you start with Bayesian networks or logic programs, you get something that is a combination of some logical constructs, some probabilities, and some uh, formalism that will that will make them uh, mix together well, right? So that uh, you get flexibility and computational um, feasibility. Now, some of these um, formalisms start with Bayesian networks, so I will not get into them here. I think Cass will talk about. Uh, Credo networks and the like, but I'll just mention, I'll go through that uh, there are many Bayesian networks that have repetitive patterns. Like if you have a Bayesian network that describes what happens in a university, you, have, you may have several variables that are related to students, courses, and so on. So it's natural to think that you might have a language that can specify very large Bayesian networks um, that have rapid repetitive structure in a very compact way. Okay, so this is one way of thinking. And people have, have tried many different languages. I, I, in this figure, you have many different uh, uh, ways of expressing large Bayesian networks, but there is, there is a different uh, path that is not just uh, drawing things, it's developing languages that can combine uh, structure, repetitive structure, and probabilities. And one way of doing this is taking logic programs and adding probabilities, probabilities, to, probabilities to them. Okay, so from now on, I will focus on logic programs um, and how you actually put probabilities on them. And this is something that has been done many, many times. And in many times, this has been done using probability intervals or credo sets. Okay. So let me, uh, let me see if this is clear enough. So what we want to do is to represent situations where you have some structure that can be maybe expressed in, in logical terms. There's re repetition in the structure, but it's a probabilistic model, okay? So we will use logic program. Well, what's logic program? There, there are many different uh, languages like uh, C, Fortran, Python, and there are languages that are based on logic. Some of them are very old. There's Prolog, and, but there are some, some, some of them are new, uh, like ASP is a, is a new formalist, relatively new uh, to express repetition and uh, express structure. Okay, so all of these formalisms, they have the same um, basic uh, features. Basically, you have rules, and you can state facts. Okay, so that's that's what you can do. Um, so here's a rule. A rule like this will say, well, if if a, you can read the rule like this, like saying, if a student is dedicated, and a course is not easy, then uh, the student will pass. That's that's say, it's a rule. Uh, and a fact is, well, there's an edge between A and B. So you can state these things in a program 
and, and if you go back in time, you will find many proposals to combine roads with products. For example, this one, this is a very influential one back in, in 92. Uh, Guy and Subramanian proposed uh, that you should have uh, goals where each one, of the, one of the, each one of these atoms could be associated with probability intervals. So the way to read this is if X and Z are connected and there's a path between Z and Y with probability larger than 0.75, then there's a path between X and Y with probability larger than or equal to 0.85, okay? So I hope it's clear enough. So there were, the, this was one example. There were many others back then uh, looking at combinations of uh, rules, facts, and probabilities. And one combination of these things that really took off since uh, 95 is a combination where you have rules, and you have probabilistic facts, okay? So you just have facts that are probabilistic, that are assigned probabilities to. So for example, you say the probability of A is 0.2, the probability of B is 0.3. And then you have rules, then you have rules. So for example, you can say the C, if you have A and B, then you have C. Now, of course, if A and B have probability 0.2 and 0.3 and they are independent, then the probability of C will be 0.06. And all these programs, all of them, all of these formulas, they adopt independence relations for probabilistic atoms. So when you have probabilistic uh, facts, sorry, probabilistic facts, you always assume they are independent. That's, you, you always do that. All right. Um, so here's an example. Here's a, here's a probabilistic uh, uh, logic programming, uh, lo probabilistic logic program that actually, if you, if you see what it does, it describes a Bayesian network. Okay, so you have a Bayesian network here on this drawing and you have a probabilistic logic program here at the right, at the left, they are equivalent. Whatever you can calculate with the Bayesian network, you can calculate with this, this program. And actually this program has been, is written in a language called Problog. And you can actually, there's a program in the internet, you can always go, there's a site, you can always go there, type in the program. <coughs> Sorry. And calculate whatever you want. It will be the same thing as, as calculating with the uh, Bayesian network. Um, with problem, with these formulas, you can actually do roles that have uh, parameters. So you can say, for example, that uh, if a student is dedicated and the course is not hard and some uh, event A happens and the probability of A is 0.1, then X will fail Y. So that's a rule. That's, that's something you can write in, in this language. I hope this is clear enough, okay? This should be easy to read. Basically, you're saying that uh, a student is dedicated with probability 0.6, uh, a course is hired with probability 0.4, and then there's, there's a, a rule for how things behave. How is it that it's dedicated students um, may fail or may not fail, okay? Um, you can have programs that describe uh, for example, random graphs. So this is a simple program. It describes how you can um, um, move around the, uh, and find paths in a random graph. And what you see here in the uh, edges are the probabilities of transitions in this graph, okay? Now, the problem with these programs uh, if, is that they may have cycles. And when they, when they have cycles, they have multiple models. A model is something that you, is an interpretation of how the atoms of the program may be true or false. So let's go through this example. I think this, this will be enough for me to convey the idea. So this little program here, it says that Dilbert 
is a person with probability 0.9. Okay. Uh, so there's probability 0.9 that, that Dilbert is a person, and then there's probability 0.1 that Dilbert is not a person. Okay. Now, when Dilbert is not a person, so if you look at the red rules, uh, person Dilbert will be false. And so the rules will not uh, do anything. <clears throat> so Dilbert will not be an engineer, and Dilbert will not be a lawyer. Okay, so with probability point one, Dilbert is not a person, Dilbert is not a lawyer, Dilbert is not an engineer. <laughs> okay, now with probability point nine, then Dilbert is a person. And what happens is you, you have rules that will say, well, if he's a lawyer, he's not an engineer. If he's an engineer, he's not a lawyer. And these rules admit uh, they, they will allow for two ways, two models, two interpretations. One interpretation is that Dilbert is an engineer and not a lawyer, and the other is that he is a lawyer and not an engineer. Okay, so he may be an engineer or a lawyer, but not both. So there are two ways of interpreting this, this program, and this is what is written down here. So if Dilbert is not a person, everything is false. If Dilbert is, is a person, then there are two ways of interpreting things. Okay, and the question is, what is the probability that Dilbert is a lawyer? Well, um, with probability point 0.1, this is sure to false. And with probability point 0.9, well, now you can distribute this probability. The probability point 0.9, he may be a lawyer or an engineer. Okay, so the probability that he's a lawyer um, is, at most 0.9, but it can be zero. And so it's an interval between these two values, okay? So uh, end of story. When you have a probabilistic logic program where you have uh, cycles, we have, you have things that either one thing or the other, uh, and you have probabilistic facts, the only way to make sense of these programs is to actually allow for probability intervals because you, you may have different ways of distributing the probability of the, prob the, of the probabilistic facts. Um, actually, I'm not sure this will help, but uh, you can imagine this as follows. You have all these probabilistic facts. Each choice of the probabilistic facts that are true is a total choice, it's called a total choice. When you have a total choice, you fix a program. If that fixed program has many, has many models. There are many ways to distribute the probability of that fact over these models. And so you don't get a single distribution, you get a set of possible distributions, uh, depending on the way you distribute the probability. So programs such as these, where you have probabilities and multiple models, they induce probability intervals if you want to know the probability of one particular atom, okay? I hope that's clear. Okay, this is, this is what's called the credo semantics. Um, this semantics was proposed in 2000, 2005 by Thomas Lukasiewicz, uh, another uh, person who's been in Zipta many times. And he came up with this, uh, this uh, approach to probabilistic logic program that actually enlarges the, the, the possible programs that you can write. Because before the credo semantics was established, a program such as these uh, had no semantics. So, so what does it mean? You have no way of distributing, uh, you have no way of understanding uh, what the program means. But now I, I think the credo semantics is, is really clear. I mean, basically what happens is for some, for some, in some situations, in this case, when Dilbert is a person, you have ways of distributing the probability over the possible models. So you naturally you have a, a credo set. Okay? Um, we have a question here. Okay? Yes. Um, All right. Just wondering now you have described a situation where if it was something multiple table models, um, can there also be infinite models that satisfy? And does do the credo semantics cover that? 
I guess the question is whether you can have uh, infinite models, right? Um, no, you can have infinite models if you have, uh, well, in the language of uh, logic program, you have functions. If you have functions, then you may have infinite, uh, infinitely many models, but actually the, the languages that people will use today in answer set programming and related language, they do not allow for functions. So the credo semantics as it is used today is for finite objects, okay? And finally many um, models. But if you allow for functions, then yes, then you could have uh, infinitely many models. You have you would have to distribute the probability over infinitely many models. I don't think people have studied this. Okay. Sorry, I, I'm not hearing. That was good. Okay. All right. So, so what I have here in this view, I would like to move on. Okay. The, the point here was to convey the idea that probabilistic logic programs from the very beginning, if you go back to 92, like, let me go back. Okay. If you go back to 92, people were already doing them using probability intervals. But maybe these languages are a bit old now and they're not adopted. What is adopted now are languages like, like this, where you have rules and probabilistic facts. This is sort of something that has been used extensively. But even those languages, the only way to make sense of them in general when you have uh, the possibility of multiple modules in, 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 because you have cycles is to allow for some credo semantics. And what, what do I mean by cycles? I mean like an engineer, uh, the rule for an engineer uh, mentions a lawyer and uh, the rule for lawyer mentions engineer. That's what causes this multiple module situation. And this is what calls for a credo semantics. Okay, I added here to this, uh, to the set of slides, a number of consequences of the credo semantics. They are, there are nice consequences, computational consequences. There are some examples. Uh, there are some discussion, there are some discussion on how you compute things, but I want to, to convey just the, the main message, which is that there's a lot of interest in probabilistic versions of logic programming uh, in particular, probabilistic versions of answer set program, which is a, a variety of logic programming. Um, and the basic uh, acyclic uh, program is uh, similar to a Bayesian network, but the general one asks and, and demands a credo, credo version of the semantics, uh, what we call credo semantics. So that's the second part, okay? Um, I hope that was clear. Let's see if, if I succeed in, in getting this trip to an end. Um, the third part, which is this, this shorter part, is on probabilistic argumentation. Okay, this is something that is happening now. It's, it's actually quite hot in AI now. There's lots of people um, looking at argumentation. Let's, let me share the screen. Okay. Uh, um, okay, I hope, I hope you see this. So probabilistic argumentation. So there's now in AI, lots of people looking at how would you organize arguments so that you can interact with people and maybe persuade them, maybe negotiate, maybe argue with them, maybe, um, indicate to them that they're not having a, a reason, they're not keeping reasonable uh, thoughts about some issue. So there's lots of things that people are, are looking uh, in terms of dealing with arguments, okay? Of course, argumentation is, a, is an old subject and it goes back in philosophy. Uh, logical thinking is just one possibility, but there's many other things that you, you can do with argumentation. And, and there are practical things like uh, interacting with people and persuading them, okay? Uh, there's one, and this is one formalism that is now very popular in AI that was proposed by Dung in 95. 
and it's it's called abstract argumentation. Okay, in abstract argumentation, uh, you have just arguments and attacks. Okay, that's what you have. You don't get into the structure of the arguments. So, and you draw them using a graph. So here is, is, is what we call an argumentation graph. You have arguments A3, A1, A0, A2, and A4. And the arrows indicate which arguments attack which arguments. So for example, A0 here in the middle, it attacks A1. And, and the interpretation is this. You cannot have A0 and A1. If you adopt A0, you must kill A1 because A0 attacks A1. Okay. Now, if you, let's say you accept A2, now A2 will kill A0. And now because A0 is attacked, A, A1 may be accepted. Okay, so it's a way of organizing uh, arguments, okay? And checking which argument survives, which argument will survive because it's defended by other arguments. So if you have an argument that is attacked and the attacker is attacked, the, the, the first argument is actually defended, it survives, okay? So that's the purpose of Dunn's argumentation graphs. Okay, to organize things. Okay, there are many variants, many, many variants. People have been looking into this for two decades now, more than two decades. Uh, there's people looking at preferences, at uh, uh, attacks, and then attacks that are not attacks, uh, many, many things. I will just focus on one particular variant, which is probabilistic argumentation. So, of course, this is where imprecise probabilities will, will show up. Now, what happens is that uh, when you have an argumentation graph, you may have many different ways of deciding which arguments are accepted and which arguments are rejected, okay? And, and the terminology is a little maybe unfortunate. We, we refer to these strategies on how to accept arguments as semantics. So there are many different semantics for argumentation graphs, okay? And so, for example, for example, uh, one argument or semantics may say, well, you cannot have an argument that is attacked by another argument that you accepted. Okay, that's 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 a rule. That makes sense. Okay, uh, another um, another um, semantics may say, well, you have you may you must have all arguments either accepted or rejected. You cannot have undecided arguments. Well, this is a rule. This is something you, you, you have to, a property you may want to enforce. And so there are many different semantics, many different ways of saying what is accepted and what is not accepted in an argumentation graph. I'll just go quickly, very quickly through this. I have no intention that you will uh, memorize this, okay? So there is, and admissible semantics. So, okay, so you accept arguments um, that defend themselves. Okay, so you, you accept a set of arguments, and if, if there is someone attacking one argument in the set, there's someone in the set that attacks the, the other guy. Okay, so they are closed, uh, they're a closed group. Then there's a complete labeling, and then there's more. There is a ground labeling, preferred labeling, stable labeling, same stable. There are many different ways of accepting things when you have an argumentation graph. Let me let me give you an example. So I think that's that's easier, okay, than just uh, piling up uh, definitions. And this is an example from an overview paper by Tony Hunter. Tony Hunter is a leading figure in in argumentation in AI. Um, he's based in London, so it's close to you uh, there in the UK. And in this survey paper by Hunter and colleagues, they have this very simple argumentation graph. Okay, you have five arguments, A2, uh, 
uh, attacks A1, attacks A3, A3 attacks A4, A4 attacks A5, and A5 attacks A4, and so on. Okay, so here's one thing. So if you accept A2, you cannot accept A1, and you cannot accept A3. This makes no sense, right? So A, A2 attacks them. So you cannot uh, accept uh, A, A1 if you accept A2. So let's look at the labelings uh, that you have down here. One labeling, the first one, is just leave everyone undecided, <laughs> right? So you're not, you're not accepting anything at all. The other one is you the labeling two is you accept A2, and by accepting A2, you must reject A1 and A3, and you're leaving A4 and A5 undecided, okay? Why is it? Because, well, A4 and A5, they attack each other. So one way of uh, keeping yourself neutral is saying, oh, I'm the undecided about both of them. But if you accept one of them, you must reject the other. And this is what happens in labelings four and five. Okay, look at labeling four. In labeling four, you accept A2, and therefore you must reject A1 and A3, and you're accepting A5, and, and therefore you're rejecting A4. And in labeling five, the last one, it's just the other way around. So you're accepting A2, and therefore you're rejecting A1 and A3. And instead of accepting A5, you're accepting A4, and then you're rejecting A5. Okay, so I hope that's clear enough. So, uh, so you have five labelings, and each one of them satisfy or not satisfy various semantics. Okay, so if you say, oh, I want an admissible semantics, this is one of the semantics I skipped uh, quickly uh, five minutes ago. I want an admissible semantics. So this first labeling is admissible. And in fact, all of these labelings are admissible. But if you say, oh, I want a complete semantics, then the first labeling is not complete. But the second label is complete. And, and, and so are the, the last two labelings. OK, so, so this, is, this is the idea. Uh, in argumentation, uh, as it is done now in AI. Okay, of course, this is very small part of what you could call argumentation theory. Right? Argumentation is a very broad thing. We we are we 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 humans can do very sophisticated stuff with arguments, but this is this is uh, uh, what's going on now. Okay, so you have argumentation graphs. And you have acceptance and rejection and, and rejection uh, rules that you follow. These rules are, are called semantics. Okay. Now, if people want to uh, assign probabilities to arguments, and this is the natural thing to do, right? You want to say, "Oh, look, I have an argument. It has probability 0.5." There are many ways to do it. So one way is what's called a constellation approach. Okay. In a constellation approach, you assign a probability to an argument. And then what happens is you, you, you branch, basically. You have a, an argumentation graph with the argument, in this case, with probability half, and without the argument, with probability half. Okay, so you have half and half, because the, the number you see in red there is half, right? You, you produce two different graphs. You may have probabilities assigned to many arguments, and usually there are independence constraints, the independence relations adopted for these numbers, for these, for these arguments, sorry. So you usually assume the arguments are independent, okay? So this is the constellation approach. This is an approach that, that typically gives you a single probability measure over arguments, because you assign a point probability to each argument, and you assume independence of arguments, okay? But there's another, another approach to argumentation, which I think makes a lot more sense. And I think it's, it's, it's being uh, adopted more widely, which is called the epistemic approach. 
And this is this is this is actually advocated by Tony Hunter, which is like I mentioned before, the, one of the leading uh, uh, researchers in, in this in this field. And there, each argument is associated with a probability, but the probability means is the probability the argument is accepted. Sometimes it's said that the probability the argument is true, but that that may be a little strange. So it's the probability that it's accepted. And then. Uh, what usually people do is they will have constraints on the probability of arguments. They will not have point probabilities, okay? Um, so for example, let me give you an example. There are, there are interpretations of these argument, argumentation graphs where if you, if you say that A attacks B, right? Let, let's go back. So here in this argumentation graph, A2 is attacking A1, right? I hope that's something you understood. So A, A2 is an argument, A1 is an argument, A, A2 is attacking A1. What an epistemic approach will say is that by having this arrow, what you actually mean is that the probability of the attacking uh, argument being larger than half <laughs> must, must imply that the probability of the attacked argument is is smaller or equal than half, okay? So what the graph is, is giving you is bounds on the probabilities of arguments. And that's the key idea of the epistemic approach. Now, if you, you see where this is going, right? You have probability constraints. Therefore, if you want to calculate the probability of some other argument, what you get are probability bounds. You get lower and upper probabilities and you obtain them by doing some uh, linear programming or nonlinear programming as, as it's as it, the, the language that you using requires. Now, there are many constraints that you can use. Um, some of them have been studied by a very nice paper by Baroni, Giacomini, and Vici, Paolo Vici, another person from Egypta that uh, uh, another person, another researcher who's, who's always uh, Egypta that uh, appears here. Um, yeah. And there is also, and I think that's the last thing I want to say, uh, a recent recent work by Tony Hunter and, and uh, Sylvia Polberg and Matthias Thin. These, these three researchers are really active in this uh, topic, where they have been proposing uh, argumentation graphs that are even more powerful because you have the argumentation graph, as you have here. This is an example from from one of their papers. You have an argumentation graph as, it, as you see in the left, where you have arguments, and here you do have the arguments there written down. You have a text, and then you have in the right uh, part of the screen, you see constraints that they associate with the arguments. And that's the, the graph itself and the constraints is what they call an epistemic graph. Now, if you read this closely, I hope you can read this. Is this clear? Can you read the, the, the figure? Um, if you read this, you will see that uh, many of these things are just uh, loose constraints. What they will say is, uh, well, if the probability of B is larger than half or the probability of C is smaller than half or the probability of D is large, smaller than half, then uh, this is equivalent to saying that the probability of A is larger than half. So this is a constraint. This, is, this will not give you a single probability measure over arguments, right? So what they do is they spend most of their, their time uh, developing methods to, to process these constraints and reach uh, lower and upper bounds for the probability of arguments. Okay, this is, this is basically what I wanted to say uh, on argumentation. There are other uh, techniques. I will just leave, leave it uh, this because too much time, uh, uh, there's, there's not enough time for this. I, I just want to, to leave the, the topic with epistemic graphs because they are so close to uh, imprecise probabilities that, uh, you know, the, we're talking about the same uh, formalisms all the time. Uh, basically, we have a graph, and you have some probabilistic logic uh, with uh, 
uh, probabilistic constraints. All right, so I hope this is clear. Uh, so let me go to my last uh, stopping uh, point here. And the last thing I want to say is about, uh, it's not about uh, representing things or representing uncertainty or handling uncertainty, it's about uh, uh, planning, it's about uh, sequential decision making. So let's see, let's see if I share the screen. Okay, I hope you see this. Let me know if you don't see the screen at any time, okay, because you must be. Uh, I hope you see this. All right, so I'll talk uh, maybe uh, 15 minutes, I guess. This is all I have, right? So Jason, help me out here. I have 15 minutes, right? You have 15, 20 minutes, let's say. 20, 20 minutes. Let's say. Okay, all right, so I'll, I'll, I'll try to, to aim at 15 and maybe go uh, take 20, we'll see. But basically, I want to, to uh, mention another topic where imprecise probabilities have had a, a, a significant presence uh, in AI, which is planning under uncertainty, okay? Um, this is related to many things that I'm sure Teddy talked about, uh, but you'll see that uh, here things are actually conceptually simpler, I guess, or, or uh, maybe more naive. Um, People just take uh, gamma maximi and uh, go go with it, and do not care about acting act state independence. So, so this this will be a bit naive. But this is what people what people do. All right. So, what is a Markov decision process? Okay. So, it's it's something that you use to to uh, reach a policy. A policy is a sequence of decisions that you may take to reach a goal. Okay. Um, so here's, uh, here's an MDP, a Markov decision process. It's a very simple one uh, where you have three states. So this is like a robot that can be standing, moving, or, or falling. Okay. If the robot is standing, he may take a, a, a green action. Um, and if he takes a green action, he, he may be moving or he may fall. Um, or he may just uh, take a, a black action. And if he, if he takes a black action, he will certainly move. So the first number that you see associated with each arrow is a probability, okay? Um, so if the robot is standing and takes the black action, the robot will move with probability one. If the, problem is, if the robot is standing, and it takes the green action, then it will, it will move with probability 0.6, or it will fall with probability 0.4. And by the way, can you see my cursor? I guess so, right? Yeah. So, uh, and then if the robot is moving and it takes a black action, it will keep moving, okay? But if the robot is moving, it takes the green action, it will move with probability 0.8, but it may fall, right? So it's like the green action is more dangerous action and the black action is a more conservative action, okay? You, you always move if you take the black action. Uh, if you take green action, you may fall. Now, what's the, the reward uh, for, you, for the robot to take the green action? Uh, the reward that you get, that the robot will get when it takes an action and moves to a particular state is given by this other number uh, associated with each arrow, okay? So each arrow has a probability of, of the transition and a reward that the robot will get if that transition happens, okay? So you see that transitions with the black action always have a reward of one. And transitions with the green action have a reward of two if things go well and have a reward of minus one if things go badly. Okay, so, so the question is with this, in this setting, what should the robot do? What, which action should the robot take? Okay, so that's the, 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 the sequential decision 
problem that I'm, I'm uh, trying to represent when I write down an MDP, a Markov decision process. And so a Markov decision process contains states, uh, actions, transitions, and the transition and rewards or costs, and the transitions may be probabilistic. Okay, so for example, if you're standing and you take the green action, there are probabilities that you, you of moving to any other particular state. Okay. So what I just said is formalized here. So the MDPs are popular in many other fields. They were imported into AI. They were definitely not invented by AI people. They were just uh, imported by people in AI looking at sequential decision making. And or as we, we say in AI planning problems. So you're planning, you're planning ahead. You want to know which decisions you want to you want to take, uh, and so people looked for a Markov decision process. And Markov decision process consists of a state space, states, actions, and transition probabilities and rewards or costs. Okay, and so I, I think if you understood this figure, you got the idea. Okay, you have states. You can move from one state to the other. These transitions are associated with probabilities and, and rewards. And you have to decide which actions to take. <clears throat> All right, so uh, how do you choose an action? How do you choose a policy? How do you choose the sequence of actions you, you may take? You have to, to evaluate policies by, by some uh, metric, by some uh, a criterion. Uh, the most common criterion, I, I just had a bunch of criteria, criteria listed here, but the most popular by far this is what, what people do, actually. Uh, the other criteria are, are just uh, uh, to mention in, in papers, but this is what actually people do. They will try to find the sequence of actions that minimize what's called discounted cost or maximize discounted reward, if you prefer to talk about rewards. So what's, a, what's discounted cost? Is the expected cost that you have if you follow those uh, actions all the way to infinity, but every step that you take, you discount the cost by multiplying it by some gamma. Okay, and gamma is a number between zero and one. Okay, if, if gamma is equal to one, then it's not discounted. Okay, then nothing is discounted. The problem of gamma equal to one is that then the optimal policy may not exist. So when people uh, talk about discounted cost, they always they always in, implicitly assume that gamma is smaller than one. So it's a number between zero and one, but it's smaller than one. And the advantage of discounted cost with, with such a gamma is that you can always find an optimal policy. There's always an optimal policy, always a sequence of uh, actions that you, you may take that minimizes the discount, the expected cost that you may that you will pay. Okay. Now there are many uh, mathematical facts about MDPs. Um, so you can calculate the expected cost from any state. This is given by this expression. Please do, do not pay too much attention. I just want to mention that these things exist. Okay. So you can calculate discounted cost starting from any particular state with any particular uh, uh, policy. And then using that, you can reach the most famous equation in, in, in the land of MDPs, which is the Belma equation. Okay, so the Belma equation is, is, is this equation in blue, and it tells you what is it that you must uh, solve in order to know at each state, what is the, the action that, he, that the robot should take, okay? So if you solve the Bellman equation, you know which action the robot will have to take at any given state. How is it done? Okay, so you associate with each state a value. And so this value for each state defines a function for each state, you have a number, and this function is called the value function. Okay, so you have an MDP, you have discounted cost, 
So you have some gamma, and then you have the value function that will tell you how much uh, discounted cost you will get, or how much discounted reward you get, or how much discounted cost you pay, if you start at that state and run the optimal policy from that state on. That's what the Bellman equation gives you, okay? It tells you how much reward will you get from any state. If you start from that state and adopt the optimal policy from that point on. And the nice thing about NDPs is that if you have the value function, if you, could, if you, if you solve the Bellman equation and you've got the value function, then you can easily find the optimal policy. You can easily find the optimal action for each statement. This is given by this last equation here. Uh, but like I said, don't, don't worry too much about the equations. This is just uh, to show you what they are. Uh, believe me, you can do it, okay? You can calculate these things. And there are algorithms to do this. Okay? So you never do it by hand. So you can do it by, you can find the optimal policy by linear programming. You can build a, a huge linear program. Um, people don't do it because uh, usually the other algorithms are much faster. And the other algorithms are value iteration and policy iteration, okay? There are algorithms um, that solve these things. Now, I, I left here in the, these, uh, the set of slides the algorithms themselves, so you can find value iteration. There's a description of what, of what it is. There is a commentary on the convergence, and there's policy iteration as well, and the commentary on, on a comment on, on the convergence of policy iteration. So, okay, believe me, these things exist, okay? And moreover, uh, you can actually represent the transition probabilities in an MDP using Bayesian networks. It's the natural thing to do because you want to represent the way states move to other states. And one natural thing to, to represent probabilities is to use Bayesian networks, and this is what people do. Okay, so I, I would say that most of the action in, in AI when it comes to planning under uncertainty is solving NDPs where transition probabilities are represented by Bayesian networks. This is where, this is really where the action is, okay? Uh, has been for 20 years. All right, so why I'm saying all this? Because uh, it's obviously hard to specify these transition probabilities, okay? This, how do you specify them? And so from the very beginning, so NDPs were defined, I think, in 57 or something like this, 1957. Uh, right from the beginning, back in 1963, there were people already asking, well, how do we get these probabilities? How do we estimate them? How do we learn them uh, from data or from experimental data? I think the first person who actually wrote about this was Silver, back in 63. Um, there's Another strategy that is used now in AI extensively, and I think Alessandro will, will, will dis discuss this later, which is to estimate not the probabilities themselves, but to estimate the value function. And this is what's called reinforcement learning, okay? All right, so there are ways, there are ways to estimate things if you want, but it's also natural to consider an explicit representation for the uncertainty in terms of credo sets. And this is what has been done since the 70s, actually, uh, in this area that deals with Markov decision process with imprecision in transition probabilities. The first work I know about this is the work by Satya and Leif from uh, 73. So this is almost 50 years old. And they, they call these uh, Markov decision processes that they consider, they, they refer to them as Markov decision processes with imprecise transition probabilities, okay? So it's perhaps the first time the, the expression imprecise probabilities was used. Um, in any case, so what is an MDPIP? What's a Markov decision process with imprecise probabilities? Well, you guessed it, right? Uh, you know where this is, is going. So it's an MDP where you have a state, 
you have an action, you have states, you have actions, you have transitions, you have rewards or costs, but the transitions may be imprecisely known. The probabilities of these transitions may be imprecisely known. So instead of having the probability of a state uh, equal to 0.4, you have that it's an interval, a probability interval, for example. Okay, so these things have been uh, explored first by Satie and Leif back in 73, and they were able to find a, a Bellman-like equation, which is really amazing. They, 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 they really solved uh, uh, many of the questions that, that you might have about uh, MDPIPs back then. So they, uh, they found a, a Bellman equation for a gamma minimax solution. What's, what's a gamma minimax solution? It's, it's a policy that will minimize the discounted cost under the most adverse selection of probabilities. Okay, so that's what they did. Um, they, they derived a policy iteration scheme for, for MDPIPs. Since then, many people have de derived value iteration schemes or algorithms for MDPIPs. This has been going for, for a while. I mean, there's always some uh, paper, some, there are, there's always papers coming out on, on this. Uh, the equation itself can be solved by bilinear programming, but there are, there are clever tricks that you can make. You can reduce the integer linear program. So there's a whole literature on, on these MDPIPs. Let me then, uh, um, so I will need more, uh, I'll, I'll need two minutes more. So I guess I'll be on time. So here, here's a list of uh, uh, interesting points that I would uh, uh, show to you on, on MDPIPs, okay? Uh, first of all, they have been used, uh, one interesting way in, in which they have been used in AI is to as abstract uh, MDPs. Like you have a, you have a problem, uh, too complicated. It's a too complicated problem. There are too many transitions. There are too many states. So starting with work by Givan, Leach, and Dean in 97, some people try to abstract out of the complicated MDP, an MDP IP, where instead of having uh, point probabilities for transitions, you have in, uh, probability intervals. And these probability intervals will sort of abstract the complexity that you have in the real uh, system. So too many things there, so you move to a, a, a less, a simpler MDPIP, and these MDPIPs, because they only deal with probability intervals, they are called bounded parameter MDPs. So they are BMDPs. That's that's. If you look for BMDPs, BMDPs, you will find these bounded parameters uh, MDPs. Um, within Izipta, within Izipta, I mean, there's there's been uh, several publications on MDPIPs. I think it started with Armanac. In the very first Izipta, he had a paper. And Armanac's work is interesting because he uses key admissibility as, as a guiding criterion to select uh, policies, okay? Uh, you remember that Satya and Leib use gamma minimax and Armanac uses key admissibility. There's also a lot of work on this by Matthias Strophis and, um, and there's also work on imprecise transition probabilities that are specified not by Bayesian networks, as usual in artificial, uh, most of the, the literature on artificial intelligence, but by, but by credo networks, because you're trying to represent the imprecision in, in the transitions, okay? One particular work that I have been involved, let me finish with something I, I participated, there's just some uh, shameless uh, propaganda here. Uh, I've, been, I, I've worked in the past on these so-called MDPSTs, uh, as a way to unify various kinds of planning uh, scenarios. So let me just explain what MDPSTs are and I'll, I'll conclude there. Uh, so in a, in a Markov decision process, when you are in a state, you're supposed to, tra tra uh, to move to another state, okay, with some probability. Now, this is probabilistic planning because you have probabilities, probabilities associated to moving from one state to the other. This is 
probability planning. There is another kind of planning in AI that is called non-deterministic planning. This is a very unfortunate name, okay? But it's the, the way people, uh, that's the word people use. In, in non-deterministic planning, you have a probability of moving from one state. No, you don't have probability. In non-deterministic planning, you have a transition from one state to a set of states. And you have to plan uh, in a way that you're safe, regardless of which state you actually move to. Okay, so there are two different uh, branches uh, of planning un under uncertainty in AI. There is plenty under uncertainty where you have probabilities. Uh, this is probabilistic planning. And there is plenty where you have uh, transitions from states to sets of states. This is called non-deterministic planning. So what we did back then, back in 2007, was to define a structure that is puts these two, thing, two things together. So when you are in a state, you can move with some probability to a set of states, right? Or with some other probably to another set of states. So this, this is, depending on how you define things, you can have probabilistic planning or non-deterministic planning, but all you have is, is a Markov decision planning uh, process with imprecise probabilities in the end, okay? So that's what we did. This is work that has been, uh, I mean, widely decided and, and used. Uh, I would like to uh, finish there. Um, and maybe repeat what I did at the, uh, what I said at the end of the morning session, the first session. I think AI has um, had an interest in, in, in precision probabilities from the very beginning, very beginning. Um, there are many different uh, topics where in the middle of many other details, you see imprecise probabilities cropping up. And what I try to do, and I hope this was useful enough, was to show a selection of topics where there are many details, but actually what matters for us is that at some point, imprecise probabilities are crucial to make things understandable and conceptually um, uh, uh, unified in a sense. Okay, so I think I'll stop there. Um, oh, thanks for your attention. And uh, I guess I forgot to thank the organizers in the morning. So I'm sorry about that because I really should thank you. Thanks for organizing, this is very nice. And I see the room filled with people, this is very nice. Thanks a lot and congratulations.